Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Schindler, the Vice Dean Emerita and of, uh, at Drexel University College of Medicine and Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics and the Medical Director of the Caring Together program, which is an addiction treatment program for women. I very much appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today about a really critical topic, women, their children, and substance use disorders, which is truly an intergenerational uh, crisis that we're experiencing and have been for some time. Um, so today I want to review a couple of things with you, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how I got involved in working in this area. Uh, first, I want to review the history of maternal substance use disorders to talk about the role of developmental trauma as well as parental exposure. And by that I mean both growing up in a household where parents use substances, uh, but also in utero exposure to substances um, and the ultimate development of substance use disorders. To review the specific treatment needs of women and their families, to talk about the impact of maternal substance use disorders on families, and the impact of maternal incarceration uh, for substance use problems on families. And then to finish up by talking about uh, making sure that we are adequately screening uh, all of our, our patients um, for substance use disorders and to talk about some of the red flags and the importance of knowing how to refer uh, patients for treatment, including families uh, that have substance use disorders. So a little bit about how I got involved in this whole area. Uh, back in the mid-1980s, we experienced another epidemic. We're going through the opioid epidemic right now, but this crack epidemic uh, created a huge amount of chaos in the lives of individuals as well as in families. And I was working at the time as a consult liaison psychiatrist in a general medical hospital and was getting very frequent calls to the maternity service to see women who were delivering cocaine-exposed infants. And at the time, there were hardly any uh, treatment programs that were available that were specific for women, that were, had gender-specific uh, treatments, treatments for women. And uh, so we decided, working in collaboration with the Department of OBGYN, the Department of Pediatrics, to create the Caring Together program. And I can talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but that was what set me on the path of having a very strong interest. And I still have a very clear memory of standing outside the uh, newborn nursery at the hospital and looking at those babies, particularly the ones in the neonatal intensive care unit, uh, who were born prematurely and thinking, if we don't do something now, this is going to be our next generation of patients. And here we are almost 30 years later um, dealing with that next generation of patients through yet another epidemic, and this time it happens to be the opioid epidemic. So let's talk a bit about uh, the current opioid epidemic. Um, we now know that drug overdoses are the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. Um, close to 22 million people in the United States age 12 and older um, have a substance use disorder, um, and that number is probably higher at this point. Approximately 2.5 million people in the United States um, have an opioid use disorder, with about 2 million uh, people addicted to prescription opioids and another close to 600,000 to heroin. Um, here in Philadelphia, um, about 9.5% of the population, uh, so about 120,000 people, um, are uh, struggling with a substance use disorder. Um, the national number, so it's slightly higher than the national number, which is 9%. And we know that uh, one of the challenges is getting people identified and getting them into treatment. Um, with data from uh, Philadelphia's uh, Department of Behavioral Health um, and Intellectual Disabilities uh, system, uh, we know that about 30,000 people are accessing treatment, and we can talk about that some more. So the rate of opioid-related overdose deaths uh, by gender and by race and ethnicity um, is important to pay attention to because although you can see from the slide that the number of women uh, that are addicted um, and die from opioid overdoses um, is about a third of what it is for men, 
uh, we do know that, um, you know, at this point uh, that women are dying um, also um, at a very significant rate. And if you look at the age distribution, what you see is that uh, most of the people that are struggling with opioid use disorder and are dying from it um, actually are in their prime childbearing years or family care years. Um, so that uh, this is a, a huge problem uh, for families overall. Um, in Philadelphia, the overdose death rate rose 43% uh, between 2009 and 2014. Um, more than 900 people died of opioid overdoses in Philly in 2016 and 2017. It was 1,271. It was slightly less in 2018. Uh, Philadelphia ranks number one in the state uh, for the rate of overdose deaths. Um, and more than 60% of those overdose deaths had the presence of an opioid, with morphine or heroin uh, being the most common drug in overdoses. We are also the number one state in oxycodone prescriptions, not something to be particularly proud of. And one of the things that we have to pay special attention to is the prescription of benzodiazepines and the availability of benzodiazepines on the street. Uh, because, in fact, in 50% of the, the deaths, um, overdose deaths in Philadelphia, uh, benzodiazepines were present. And I um, reluctantly predict that that may be our next epidemic. Uh, we know that um, emergency medical services um, are called on a very regular basis uh, to rescue people or to try to rescue people who have overdosed. So this is, this is just a chart to show you that uh, overdose deaths, and that is the sort of um, greenish line, um, has, you know, escalated uh, almost exponentially. The number of homicides in the city has dropped. Um, and that's the, the red line. You can see that trending down. Um, and other, um, intent, other unintentional um, injuries has been drifting down. Um, the suicide rate has remained reasonably steady. Um, and then by drugs, um, in, again, in Philadelphia for residents and non-residents, um, heroin, as you can see, um, in the blue line is the leading uh, cause of overdose deaths. Uh, but fentanyl, um, the reddish line, um, is uh, present in increasing numbers of deaths in the city. So when we stop to think about what people are using, um, and these are folks age 12 and older, uh, what we're seeing is that um, marijuana is the number one substance um, of use, uh, but followed number two by pain relievers. And these are narcotic pain relievers, and number three by tranquilizers. And then the numbers drift down uh, for other substances. So when we talk about uh, overdose deaths from uh, opioids, we need to just remind ourselves uh, what opioids are and what we're talking about. Uh, so prescription pain relievers, um, which account for over uh, 20,000 deaths in the United States, include oxycodone, hydrocodone, codeine, morphine, tramadol, and fentanyl. Uh, heroin accounts for about 15,000 deaths in the United States. Um, and 23 of these individuals um, who use heroin um, develop an addiction. That's much higher uh, than the rate, the around 10% rate for other substances. And four out of five heroin users actually started with prescription pain relievers. So a big problem. But clearly not a new problem. Um, and let's put this particularly for women, in some historic context. Uh, when we go back uh, to the 1800s, what we learn is that there was a concern back then about pregnant women using substances, uh, and particularly opium. Um, you can see from the picture, these are opium dens um, showing women who um, have been using opium. Uh, and it was, again, a medical prescription that started their use of opium. During the late 1800s, physicians uh, recognized, actually, neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, that was new data for me um, a couple of years ago, because I had always thought that that was something that occurred in the opioid um, epidemic that occurred uh, back in the seven, 1970s and 80s, uh, but in fact, neonatal absence syndrome had been identified even earlier than that, at least 100 years before that. Um, as physicians back in the 1900s became better educated about the drawbacks of prescribing narcotics, uh, 
the folks that were using them started to see their supply shrink. And again, we're seeing this, you know, um, a whole century later um, or more uh, recurring. Um, and women unable to stop using substances, again, were forced to seek them from illegitimate sources. Back in 1914, Congress passed the Harrison Narcotics Act, and that uh, dramatically changed narcotic prescribing and dispensing uh, practices and required that addictive substances had to be prescribed by a licensed health profession. Um, some enlightened physicians at that point started to treat opioid addiction with morphine, uh, but then this practice was actually banned by the Supreme Court. Um, and one of the, the things that kind of fell out of all of this was that treatment of substance use disorders moved out of the arena of general medical practice. Um, and we're just now, uh, with this current epidemic, reintegrating all of that. This is a slide uh, from pediatrics uh, from 2014, uh, which gives you a timeline. It's not uh, one that I want to go over in great detail, uh, but one that um, you can take a look at. And it gives you a sense of um, how uh, we've been addressing, uh, from a medical perspective, the uh, previous and current opioid epidemic. So when you stop and think about what patients get prescribed by their clinicians. Um, it's pretty dramatic to see that hypertensive medications are probably the most prescribed medications. Lipid regulators are number two. Antidepressants are number three. But number four um, is narcotic analgesics. Um, so these are still extraordinarily widely prescribed. And you know, we're all trying to struggle to decide how we can go about addressing this problem um, and you know who's to blame. And there's a lot of finger pointing that's going on. But as with most things in life, um, there's this has a multifactorial etiology. Certainly the marketing of prescription opioids by Big Pharma, particularly Purdue, and um, you just heard this week in the news that several people in the distribution chain have been arrested, um, you know, has played a role in all of this. But we've also focused on pain relief scales, um, and that has become a vital sign. Um, and we want people not to be in pain uh, so that clinicians have probably overprescribed to keep their patients happy. Um, the internet has probably played a role uh, because everybody's writing about their relationship with their, their clinician. Um, they want, and, and prescribers, you know, want their patients to be satisfied. Uh, so uh, patient satisfaction scales have also uh, come into play. Poor clinician uh, screening for potential addiction, knowing who the person is that may be at risk, and we'll talk a little bit more about those red flags later, uh, but also poor physician knowledge about pain management modalities and realizing that opioids are not the only answer. Um, the fact that clinicians have 15 minutes frequently uh, to take care of a patient means that you end up seeing writing a prescription as a solution rather than spending time trying to figure out a better solution for patients' pain. And then what we see are that folks, when they can no longer get their prescription opioids, switching over to either heroin or fentanyl or both um, and other substances uh, to try to maintain themselves out of withdrawal. And then, of course, there's limited access to treatment, um, availability, uh, poor insurance coverage for both addiction and psychiatric treatment. So all of these are challenges and things that have contributed to where we are with this epidemic right now. So how do we identify the people that are at risk before we sit down and write any of those prescriptions um, and, and know uh, what we need uh, to write for? So the first big red flag is past misuse of prescription opioids. It's the strongest risk factor for starting heroin use, especially on people who have become dependent. Uh, upon or abuse prescription opioids in the past year. Also, widespread opioid exposure and increasing rates of opioid addiction have played a major role in the growth of heroin use. Nine out of 10 people who use heroin have used at least one other drug, and that's really important to keep in mind. We're seeing tremendous amounts of polypharmacy on the part of folks who have uh, a dependence on one substance. Three quarters of new heroin users um, have misused prescription opioids in the past, and two thirds of people seeking treatment uh, for addiction to opioids um, and who initiated uh, the use of opioids in 2015 started with prescription opioids. And we've mentioned that before. So those are all important red flags. 
So this epidemic, as, as well as all substance use, has had a huge impact on the healthcare system. We spend 25% of all of our healthcare dollars on the sequelae of substance use disorders, um, about $700 billion um, in 2015, and that was the most recent data I could find. But we spend only 2.5% of all that money on treatment. So when you think about all the patients that you are likely to see, these are folks that may have a substance use disorder. These are folks um, who have injuries secondary to domestic violence or motor vehicle accidents, other trauma, um, accidental or deliberate overdoses, uh, patients who come in in withdrawal symptoms, but also creates a lot of other physiologic disorders, including hematologic disorders, liver disease, renal failure, um, and there are a lot of comorbid uh, medical disorders, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, which when patients are actively using, uh, don't always recognize or get medical care for the, the medical disorders they have, and it's extremely difficult for them to be compliant uh, with the treatment that they need uh, to uh, stay healthy. The comorbid psychiatric disorders play a very big role. Mood disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, schizophrenia, we know the rates of co-occurring psychiatric disorders in a substance use population is very high, probably close to 80% for women, uh, maybe 60% uh, percentage, percent or, or perhaps more for men. Uh, we talked about medication noncompliance, and then there are the systemic infections that people get, their risk for HIV, other sexually transmitted diseases. And we sometimes forget that most of these folks have a dependence on nicotine as well, which then contributes to a host of other medical problems. So as healthcare providers, you know, what's the role? Um, we need to be able to be better at identifying uh, folks who have substance use disorders, uh, getting patients in, in, engaged in treatment, uh, but also uh, spending time thinking about prevention and what we can do uh, to prevent that. And women particularly have limited points of entry into the healthcare system. Uh, these are folks who routinely don't get prenatal care. Um, limited pediatric and family history screening um, is done. Um, I gave a pediatric grand rounds last fall at St. Chris, and I asked uh, the audience there, and there were about 100 people there, how many folks actually screen for uh, substance use within the family. And only two hands went up. It was shocking. They screened for drug, for, for uh, guns in the household. They screened for smoking in the household. They do not ask about a family history of substance use. Uh, there's still a lot of societal stigma, obviously, and uh, medical professionals. We've been burned uh, by patients, um, and so we have some negative countertransference around that, too. And there, I just put some links to resources for you. So I want to make this more uh, patient-centered and tell you about a patient uh, that uh, we've certainly seen in Caring Together. Um, this is a 37-year-old mother of two children. Um, 10 and 7 years old, both with uh, diagnosed with ADHD, and I put that in quotes because that's mom's uh, and the school's diagnosis. Uh, DHS um, is involved uh, with the children uh, because, in fact, they are living uh, with their mother, or with, with the patient's mother. She made her first prenatal visit at 18 weeks, and her urinary drug screen was positive for both opioids and marijuana. And she was treated uh, with opioid analgesics three years previously following an emergency C-section for a stillborn child at 40 weeks gestation. Um, and she felt, as did the clinicians that were taking care of her and who felt just terrible about what had happened, uh, that the Percocets that she was getting was helping with her physical pain post C-section, but also with her emotional pain. And so her OB continued to give her several prescriptions uh, for uh, the Percocets, and then her primary care physician continued. Uh, to give her prescriptions. Um, and when she could no longer reach, get those, she ended up buying them on the street and was using Percocets daily. Um, her history was important. At the age of 12, uh, she started sporadically using uh, alcohol, using alcohol at the age of 12, sporadically using marijuana at the age of 13, 
and then began using crack cocaine um, at the age of 26 following a failed and abusive marriage, um, at which point she also increased her marijuana use. The oldest of three children, um, her mother was an alcoholic and in recovery, but uh, when she was drinking was physically abusive and the patient was sexually abused by her maternal grandfather from the age of 10 to 15. She did manage to get through school. She graduated from college, had paralegal training, and her longest job was for five years. So at the time we saw her, um, initially she was homeless, back living with her mother who at this point was in recovery. So we'll come back to her in a little bit, but I, I think this is such a prototypical uh, situation, um, certainly one that we see a lot at Caring Together that I wanted to introduce her to you and uh, we'll talk more about her. So what do we know about women and substance use? Uh, we know that women become addicted more quickly and at lower doses than men. Uh, we know that women are screened for substance use disorders by, by their primary uh, care providers uh, less often than men for substance use disorders. Uh, they are 48% more likely to be treated with a narcotic or an anxiolytic than men uh, with the same presenting symptoms. More than 12 million uh, women um, are drug and alcohol users in the United States. 10% of women consume, between in major childbearing year, 18 to 34, consume more than two drinks of alcohol a day. And 55% are more likely to abuse a prescription drug. Two thirds of all HIV cases in women involve substance use. There are a lot of comorbid factors uh, that impact on pregnancy, uh, the pregnancy outcome, infants, and ultimately on adult development. And these are all important for us to keep in mind. Uh, first is that women who use one substance use frequently will abuse more than one substance, um, which may have direct and erratic toxic effects on the developing fetus and on maternal physiology. Um, we know that there's drug-drug interaction between the substances that are used. We know that women who are using substances are much less likely to get prenatal care and have a higher rate of obstetrical complications. Um, inadequate medical care, nutrition um, is usually poor. Um, there's a high rate of exposure to, to uh, infection. Um, and family disruption and child abuse and neglect are common. Um, and substance use, you know, plays a huge role in having people slide down the Hollingshead scale. And so poverty, homelessness, and the risk of incarceration is very high in this population. Additional comorbid factors, you know, these are frequently folks who have had poor parenting role models. Um, so their parenting skills um, are less than adequate. They've been exposed to family violence, physical and sexual abuse, just as in our patient. Um, the rate for women is somewhere around 60 to 80 percent. And then there's a much higher rate of uh, maternal psychiatric disorders, so mood disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, and interestingly enough, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, there's that family history of chemical dependency, including early exposure to drugs and alcohol, um, and parental incarceration. So as I, you know, this is an intergenerational problem and a, and a crisis, as I, I said in the beginning. So what more do we know about their mo these moms? 80% um, have parental substance abuse, 60 to 80% develop mental, sexual, and physical abuse. Um, in utero exposure uh, to substances, the patient that I described, her mother was drinking at the time uh, that she was pregnant with our patient. Um, and so, you know, we, we talk about fetal alcohol effects, fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder, not always, um, you know, clear or certainly not screened for, um, and because the the symptoms may be very subtle um, and have a lot more to do with cognitive uh, dysfunction, um, we don't always pick up on that. Uh, but it's one of the questions that we routinely ask all of our patients, um, whether they knew when they have a family history, uh, whether their mom used when they were pregnant. Um, and we focus on the fetal alcohol part of it, but the reality is that all substances have some um, impact or can have some impact on um, brain development. Uh, women are more likely than men to acknowledge their substance use, um, struggle with self-esteem issues, have very high rates, as I mentioned, of depression, PTSD, 
Um, the whole issue of personality disorders is one that I have a great deal of difficulty with because it takes a good year of sobriety uh, to be able to sort out whether somebody in fact does have a personality disorder and I will not make a diagnosis um, unless I'm really convinced uh, that that's the case after a year of sobriety. And we know that being involved in a stable relationship and having children can be protective. So let's move on and talk. We talked about the role of the medical system and some of the medical issues. Let's move on and talk about the legal system. Uh, because in fact, in this country, we have criminalized maternal substance use. Uh, women, and from the chart down at the bottom on the right-hand side, you'll see that orange colored block. Uh, that is uh, the rise of the prison women, women in prison. Um, and these are primarily for substance-related crimes. And there are all kinds of legal issues that come up. Um, and different states on um, different jurisdictions have different laws about this. Some are more stringent than others. Uh, there are 25 states that have prosecuted women for murder, for manslaughter, for child abuse or endangerment, or drug delivery to a minor um, if the woman uses during pregnancy. There are 15 states who mandate professionals report prenatal drug use, 18, which will drive, obviously, women away from getting prenatal care. 18 states consider prenatal substance abuse uh, child abuse under their civil child welfare statutes. Four states consider prenatal substance um, use as a criminal act uh, reported to the criminal justice system, Tennessee, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and South Dakota. And then, of course, you know, there are all the external mandates that involve DHS um, and the need for foster care for children. So one of the really best resources, I think, uh, for folks to, to look at is the work that's done uh, by the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Um, if any of you were at the Sex and Gender Research Forum last month at Drexel, um, you heard Lynn Paltrow talk. Um, she is an attorney who has been working in this area, has written a book called Punishing Pregnant Women for their behavior during pregnancy um, and um, is part of this organization, National Advocates for Pregnant Women, um, and there are tremendous resources on that website. So what happens when you take a mom um, or a dad who's uh, been incarcerated for substance use problems? If you look at the data um, and the impact of incarceration on families, uh, we know that current caregivers of minor children or parents, um, when a father is incarcerated, uh, what happens is that uh, the child's other parent, who is usually the mom, so almost 90%, um, get custody. And there's overlap in these numbers, but get custody of, of the child or children. 13% um, grandparents. If it's the mom that's incarcerated, um, it's only 37% the child's other parent. Uh, frequently, the grandparents have to take on responsibility um, or children go into foster care, more likely, uh, than if it's the dad that's incarcerated. Okay, something's, okay. This is a little messed up. Okay, so women in incarceration, uh, we know a number of things. Women have a five-year recidivism rate for drug-related offenses. Um, women inmates have higher than community rates of hypertension, uh, diabetes, sexually transmitted diseases, so lots of medical problems. 73% of women in state prison have a co-occurring mental health problem compared to 55% of men. Um, women inmates are three times as likely as incarcerated men to report physical and sexual abuse prior to incarceration. And most importantly, two-thirds of mothers that are in prison have minor children. So this just shows you the, the high rates of mental illness, psychological distress, and non-therapeutic, in folks with non-therapeutic drug use. Uh, much higher, as you see, all the way to the right uh, for women than it is for men. And again, uh, you know, these are women in their prime childbearing years. Okay, substance dependence or abuse among adults age age and by major depressive episode, again, very high rates of depression. So who are the families? Um, who are we talking about? Um, already you've heard that there's a very high rate of familial substance use, high rates of family disruption, high rates of psychiatric disorders within the families, high rates of family violence, both physical abuse as well as sexual abuse. Uh, we know that male partners uh, can frequently uh, be either using substances or selling substances. And we know that these folks have 
um, poor parenting role models. So this clearly is an intergenerational and developmental disorder. So what are the opportunities that we have um, to you know, make changes for patients, both in the healthcare system as well as the legal system? We have to really focus on active screening by all primary care uh, providers, emergency medicine providers, pediatricians, mental health, all mental health providers, early identification of folks who are at risk, screening for substance use, um, especially early onset. And one of the things that I hear regularly from patients, I do all the psychiatric evaluations on the patients coming to Caring Together, um, is that they started drinking usually um, in at the age of six, seven, eight years old, uh, going around the house if there's empty bottles or uh, beer or you know glasses with liquor in them, um, and some on some patients report uh, that their parents actually use alcohol to kind of settle them down, and you know if they're upset or you know um, creating some chaos within the family, uh, they'll provide them with alcohol and usually in early teens some marijuana. So it's really important to be screening all family for substance use, screening for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And again, I have that in quotes only because uh, you want to screen for any cognitive uh, disability that the patient may have, learning disability that the patient may have um, that may not just be alcohol related, but to, related to other substances. Um, and obviously screening for physical and sexual abuse and trauma. Um, you want to early make early identity provide early identification and treatment for mood and anxiety disorders, particularly uh, PTSD, before self patients start to self-medicate with substances, and to have an integrated and an inclusive family approach to treatment. So what are our roles as healthcare providers? We need to recognize that women can be at high risk for prescription drug use and overdoses, uh, discuss pain management approaches, um, if we're prescribing medication for pain, discuss the risks and benefits of taking prescription painkillers, especially during pregnancy. Um, and uh, there's little data to support the importance or the use, important use of painkillers for chronic conditions. Uh, so really making sure that we're talking to folks about alternate methods of approaching pain management. We need to talk with pregnant women um, who are dependent on prescription painkillers about their treatment options, particularly opioid agonist therapy. And using the prescription drug monitoring program, incredibly useful uh, tool that everybody who is providing prescriptions to patients or taking care of patients who other people may be providing prescriptions to. Um, this is the electronic database. It's active in most states in the United States and it tracks the prescriptions of controlled substances uh, that patients are being given. And I have been surprised many times, things that my patients may not have told me that they were getting, uh, particularly benzos, sometimes opioids. Uh, they filled those prescriptions and that is in the database. So a uh, very important tool to use. Um, as we approach both pregnant and parenting women, we want to be sure that we have a clear, open, and non-judgmental communication style um, around their substance use, around treatment options, and um, consent. Um, it is not advised to abruptly discontinue opioids. Uh, people don't often die from the discontinuation of opioids. Uh, they do from benzodiazepines, and frequently they're used concomitantly. Um, and medically during pregnancy, medically supervised withdrawal is not uh, recommended at all because it puts the fetus into acute withdrawal as well. Um, so it's important to be using an opioid agonist, um, either methadone or buprenorphine. Um, otherwise, we have a very high relapse rate in this patient population. And as I said, it puts the, uh, the fetus at high risk. We want to engage pediatricians um, prior to delivery to maximize care of the patient and to make sure that they are are warm handoffs to gender sensitive addiction treatment programs uh, that you don't just you know say to somebody here's a list of programs you should go to you want to have um, a way of making sure that that program knows the patient's coming uh, we work with peer specialists who connect uh, with individuals who need treatment um, and help them navigate their way into treatment and monitor them afterwards and make sure that we're ensuring uh, that both the mom and the baby are going to be safe when they're discharged from the hospital. So just a few words about pharmacologic options uh, for opioid use disorder. There's been a reasonable amount of resistance in the medical community uh, for using this in the sense that you may be substituting one opioid for another. Um, 
and we have to get over that um, because um, these are life-saving treatments. Um, you're probably most familiar with the use of methadone. It's been around for a long time. It's very highly regulated. There are methadone clinics around the city uh, that patients go to to get their methadone daily. Um, and then there are things called full antagonists. This is naloxone and naltrexone. Um, these are uh, very effective, obviously, naloxone. Um, is life-saving for people who have overdosed, Narcan. Um, naltrexone um, comes in two forms. It comes in a pill form. It comes in an injectable form called Vivitrol. Um, and these work uh, very effectively uh, to prevent cravings uh, for substances. Um, you can't give them to somebody who's actively using. Um, you have to be off of a, a, an opioid for at least a week and, and frequently 10 days before you can start that. Otherwise, you'll precipitate withdrawal. And then buprenorphine, uh, which comes also combined with naloxone um, as uh, suboxone. Uh, but for pregnant women, we use buprenorphine alone. Uh, we don't use suboxone. So if you look at what's happened in this country in terms of the number of deliveries uh, of patients who um, have opioid use disorder, that number has escalated um, dramatically from about 2006, and this data goes up to 2014, uh, but that number has continued to go up. Um, there are estimated about... Uh, there's been a five-fold increase uh, since 2000 um, in the number of babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. And every 25 minutes, a baby is born uh, suffering from opioid withdrawal. So you can imagine uh, the impact on both uh, moms, babies, families um, of this, uh, this epidemic. Uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome um, is something that I mentioned earlier, has been known for way more than a century. Uh, it should be expected and managed, um, there's a 60 to 80% risk of uh, exposure. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're screening both the moms as well as the baby's urine as well as the meconium uh, for opioids. Um, and the symptoms are very similar to what you see in withdrawal from uh, patients, adult patients. Uh, High-pitched crying, irritability, increased muscle tone, poor feeding, uh, vomiting, loose stools, dehydration, poor weight gain. Um, seizures occur in anywhere from 2 to 11% of patients. Um, frequently, we use the Finnegan scoring system um, for monitoring patients, but there's been a lot of debate about the use of that scale now. Um, Dr. Finnegan uh, was a neonatologist at Jefferson, a graduate of our medical school, of Drexel, um, when, when it was Hahnemann. Um, and um, her scale's been used pretty widely, but there's some debate now about interrater variability in the use of that scale. And there's some very interesting work that's going on both at Yale and at Boston University now, um, and there's a publication in Pediatrics in 2017 uh, that talks a lot about the importance of skin-to-skin -skin contact for newborns that are having neonatal abstinence syndrome um, and cuddling. Um, and many of these babies have been able to do without um, tincture of morphine or some other opioid substitute to manage their symptoms. Um, we don't know yet um, enough about neurodevelopmental outcomes in these children, um, and they're going to need to be followed. So what about treating pregnant women? Obviously, screening is, is critical. Um, as I mentioned, we don't withdraw opioids. Um, there's a debate about whether methadone or buprenorphine is best. I think that debate's going to go on for a while. There have been some studies that say one thing and other studies that say another. Um, buprenorphine is clearly easier to use. It's a prescription that you can write. Um, the patient doesn't have to come to a clinic every day um, and so may increase compliance. Um, as the pregnancy progresses, patients may need more rather than less uh, buprenorphine um, and we may need to give patients pain medication as well. Um, Turns out that encouraging breastfeeding is important. Uh, minimal concentrations occur in breast milk. Um, and again, we talked about the importance of a warm handoff. So this is an old slide. I went looking to see if anybody had done this, and I probably should try to do something myself um, uh, with this. Uh, it's not 
the best slide, it's a little fuzzy, uh, that comes uh, from Harm Reduction Journal back in uh, 2004. But I particularly like it because it really shows you the complexity of the impact of maternal substance use and what happens to um, children. Um, and we know that obviously, you know, uh, infants come loaded genetically um, and also um, are, are you know, subjected to their prenatal environment, uh, which may be teratogenic, which may show immediate changes. It may show latent changes. Um, and then there's the postnatal environment and the caregiving environment, um, which may create risk for the patient. Um, but we also need to think about, in terms of development, what's protective and what, what is helpful um, and what changes we can make. When we got our first grant to start caring together, uh, back um, in 1990, 1989, 90, uh, we went to talk to the chair of pediatrics. We were very excited about it, uh, but also kind of overwhelmed because we were starting up something brand new um, in the midst of this cocaine epidemic. And he said two things to us uh, that I think were very important. Uh, one was that we have to remember the plasticity of the newborn um, human brain and the potential for growth and change, even if there's been some exposure. And he also said to us, if you can keep two babies out of the neonatal intensive care unit, we, the grant was $1.5 million over three years, he said, you will save that amount of money each year, um, just keeping two babies out of the NICU. So um, I kind of carry that message with me um, when I think about uh, outcomes and also prevention. So let me give you an update on our patient. Uh, we did refer her, uh, he was, I'm sorry, she was referred to us uh, to OB, uh, I'm sorry, by OB to caring together um, at 20 weeks. She remembers she came in at about 18 weeks uh, to provide treatment for her co-occurring psychiatric disorder, uh, which was PTSD and uh, depression. Um, and she uh, got group and individual addiction counseling as well as uh, treatment for her uh, co-occurring psychiatric disorders. She wanted to be detoxed from Percocet, uh, which as I mentioned was not a desirable uh, approach at this point, uh, but agreed to start medication-assisted treatment with buprenorphine. And we titrated her dose to eight milligrams twice a day, uh, which prevented her withdrawal symptoms and prevented her from having cravings at 32 weeks, um, as her fetus grew and, you know, her, her volume, um, fluid volume grew um, and essentially was dilating, diluting um, her, her buprenorphine, uh, she required an additional dose of four milligrams at midday. Um, she delivered a male at 39 weeks who required detox as well. Um, the baby was in the neonatal intensive care unit for 15 days, um, and DHS did come and follow up to make sure that she was taking the baby home to a safe environment. Um, she, um, the baby has since done extremely well. She has done extremely well. Um, we restarted her Suboxone postpartum. Um, she wants to taper, um, but we, we just this week had the taper conversation again, and she's not quite there and quite uh, ready, but she's been very involved in parenting uh, with us and bringing the baby with her uh, to the program. And he is adorable, I have to say. Um, so, and, and seems to be doing really well. Um, so one of the things we can't forget about are kids that are growing up in households where there are substances, opioid, particularly opioid pain relievers around. This graph shows you the dramatic rise in uh, the number of kids that are being brought to emergency rooms for accidental overdoses, getting into their parents' substances. So we have to um, keep that in mind. So when you're treating substance use disorders, um, you obviously want to work with the patient to decide, you know, help them decide and um, help you decide uh, whether they're ready to make a change, whether they're ready to engage in treatment. Um, utilize motivational interviewing uh, techniques. I, I like to talk about the five P's um, in terms of particularly opioid risk, prevention, uh, parent, parents, um, you know, the parental role, whether they've used or not, um, psychological distress, prior history, and personal history of substance use disorders. And there are a host of other screening tools that are out there and available. Um, both SAMHSA, NIDA, um, all have uh, great resources on their website. 
you need to use ASAM criteria, American Society of Addiction Medicine criteria, to just help determine level of care. Uh, we need to individualize treatment for um, our patients. Um, and treatment needs to be ready when the patient's ready. Um, and that's one of the, you know, the very big lessons I think we all who work in this field have learned. We want to focus on risk reduction. Um, clearly, we would like people to not use anything. But if they're reducing their risk, uh, that's a good thing. Keeping people in treatment longer um, is very important. So the longer somebody stays in treatment, the better their outcome is. Um, and you have to keep reassessing treatment needs. We have people who relapse. They may need to go to residential treatment. They may need to be detoxed. Uh, so uh, we have to be flexible in terms of uh, when people, where, where people need to get their treatment from. Uh, Medication-assisted treatment when indicated. Um, and I include treating psychiatric disorders as part of medication-assisted treatment, because if you don't treat the bipolar disorder, if you don't treat the PTSD, um, patients are going to relapse, um, which is, you know, the same as treating the co-occurring disorders. Um, treatment doesn't always have to be voluntary, and sometimes having DHS there, sometimes having the criminal justice system there, um, putting, you know, some restrictions on patients um, can be very helpful. Um, monitoring drug use, you have to be doing uh, urine drug screens, um, using evidence-based treatment approaches. And I want to say something about 12 steps, because I think too many clinicians think about 12 steps as being a solution for treatment. It is not. It is not an evidence-based treatment. Uh, it is a great adjunct uh, for some people um, as a support system, uh, but we forget sometimes that it is not treatment. It's never been studied. There's a great article that's in the Atlantic, and if anybody um, is interested, I can send you the reference uh, to that. In terms of recovery management, helping people identify their triggers, people, places, and things, um, trauma-informed, always um, helping people with stress management. We mentioned talking, treating the co-occurring psychiatric disorders and medical disorders, um, helping people with anger management, um, interpersonal communication, helping people manage their cravings, um, creating recovery networks for folks uh, that will help them stay sober, combating negative thinking, and helping them handle boredom. Um, because frequently people will use when they're bored. Gender-sensitive treatment approaches, um, safe nurturing environments, whether it's inpatient, uh, whether it's residential, outpatient, with, within a shelter system, uh, providing um, empowerment and assertiveness training. We mentioned anger management, the comorbid psychiatric disorders, focusing on relationship issues, which are really critical uh, for women. Um, the role of their kids in relapse prevention, focusing on social, biological factors. And many of the women that come to us talk about how important it is to be able to be in a single-sex group, to have a gender-sensitive group. Um, gives them um, a lot more freedom to explore issues that they otherwise wouldn't in a co-ed group. Uh, providing parenting is critical. We have child care in our program, which has uh, been a big help uh, for many of the women. Um, transportation, literacy training, job training, um, you know, pediatric services and OBGYN services are all critical. So family reunification um, also um, is very important. Um, we need to assess risks individuals' wishes for reunification. And that can vary, and it's surprising. There are some moms who are so focused um, on getting their kids back that they forget that they need to be taking care of themselves and pay attention to their recovery. Um, they lose sight of, of what they need to do. So just a few summary key points. Um, remember that addiction is a chronic illness, uh, that maternal substance use is intergenerational. Um, we need to all be screening our patients for substance use disorders, um, including their parents and young adolescents, and even you know kids younger than adolescents. Uh, make sure that we are prescribing safely. Um, remember that treatment works, and that 12 steps can be a useful adjunct, but it's not treatment. Uh, we need to connect all individuals to treatment and advocate for them in the health care system. And as a chronic medical condition, addiction treatment should be long-term. Uh, we used to think that you know a couple of sessions, and that's what some insurance carriers think, um, and you're done. It is not. It's a, and we would never do this with somebody with diabetes or with hypertension. We continue to see them and we continue to treat them. And we have to treat substance use um, disorders the same way. 
Pregnancy and parenting and family engagement is a huge window of opportunity for patients and for all of us um, who are providing uh, support and help. Um, because it's a time for reflection and reassessment, um, we can help uh, individuals and families uh, through motivational interviewing, facilitate their goals um, to offer referrals and coordinate care to address any barriers that somebody may have, and addressing our own personal attitude as well and remembering that treatment works. So I mentioned uh, both SAMHSA and NIDA as being great places for resources. Um, they are wonderful websites um, and tremendous resources, so I would encourage all of you to use them.